So I'll try to keep an eye on time, but Madalena, give me my, 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 you know, give me my quarter of an hour, so now I've got five minutes, okay. my 20 minutes, and I'll be as quick as I can. And um, well, after that, and, and I'm very glad indeed to have uh, a number of friends in, here in, in, in Melbourne and, and some, some friends in transit, such as Madalena. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's a fantastic um, event. Now, I'm not going to talk about, I will mention it at the end, that exhibition, but I'm not going to talk about the exhibition that we organized as part of the project that I was working on. Um, I'm going to talk about other representations of Italian, and, and we'll talk about Italian what in a second, in New York. But let me situate my um, talk first. So indeed, the, the work that I'm going to talk about is part of a broader project which was known uh, for short as, as TML, or Transnationalizing Modern Languages, if you want the full-blown thing, which is unpronounceable. And it was part, it was a large grant that was funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council, which is the Research Council for the Humanities in the UK. Um, it had a number of collaborators, collaborators, yeah, partners, collaborators. Uh, it had a number of collaborators. Um, it had a number of partners, including it did Quasit, um, and the Museo Storico Italiano here in Melbourne, and uh, Monash University here in Melbourne, and also the Calandra Institute in New York. So I feel I'm at home in many ways. And indeed, that exhibition that Madalena was mentioning was here last year. We opened it pretty much exactly a year ago with Ferdinando, Paolo, and, and Rita, and, and others. Um, now, TML is, is um, it's part of that scheme, Translating Cultures, um, but it was pretty much about some of the things that a number of people have been talking about already. It was about mobility, about placing mobility center stage when we talk about migration, when we talk about diaspora, when we talk about culture uh, more generally. And so what I have in mind here, of course, is the mobility turn that Loretta Baldassar mentioned yesterday, that Luisa mentioned a little, little bit earlier in this room. Also the importance of thinking in plural, fluid, multidimensional mobility networks, which is at the core of what Joe Lobianco was talking about very beautifully and, 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 and um, sort of uh, elegantly this morning. Now within TML, we have been asking what happens if we see multiple forms of mobility, including migration, translation, and also other multilingual and cultural practices as deeply connected phenomena involving multiple agencies and engaging both individuals and communities in the creation of complex knowledge, affect, and memory networks. Madalena was mentioning the importance of, of affect and, and of that element. Now this means foregrounding the connectedness of different kinds of mobility as well as of translation. And this is, I would argue, directly relevant to the way in which we think about Italian cultures, and in particular, Italian diasporic cultures. They are transnational, they are translational, but we've had some fantastic examples of this. Now, traditionally, forms of human mobility have been understood as separate entities and studied under different disciplines. But boundaries are shifting in disciplines as well as in human mobilities. And so much so that in a few years ago, it was 2006 actually, Hannan, Schoen and Ari identified what had they called and has since become known as the, the mobility turn, spreading into and transforming the social sciences. But I would say it is transforming also the humanities, not just the social sciences. And they noted that the concept of mobilities encompasses both the large scale movements of peoples, objects, capital and information across the world, and the more local processes of daily transportation, movement through public space, and the travel of material things with everyday life. Now, all of these mobilities, the big ones and the small ones, are also entangled with linguistic, narrative, and representational, as well as self-representational, as Rita was reminding us the other day, phenomena. And they form what I call multinodal webs, which are relational and are performative, and which make little sense if we try to interpret them in terms of traditional, atomized, discipline-bound models and methods. So what I'm talking about is the need to think about mobilities in, in a more fluid uh, fashion. So we need to think in terms of intersectionality, as we know, uh, so gender and, and, and race and class and so on, but also what this means is that we need to create maps or cartographies and research practices which connect multiple dimensions. Temporality, spatiality, subjectivity are deeply connected in mobility phenomena, something which is powerfully encapsulated in Michel de Certeau's famous definition according to which space is a practiced place. 
it's the movement, the inhabiting of that, that place that makes it a space. And that entails uh, space, but also the same temporality and, and, and subjectivity. In translation studies, recent work has concentrated on the spatial embodiment of translation and the way it informs how we inhabit space. Michael Cronin, Sherry Simon have worked on bi and multilingual cities. Cronin has also developed notions of microspection, which Rita mentioned, and denizenship, our, our belonging and our deep uh, levels of citizenship. And I've been developing a notion of a translation continuum to describe the cultural and linguistic practices which form the translational fabric of our lives. <clears throat> now, this takes me almost to my topic for today, which is memory in the museum, and the way in which specifically Italian presence, Italian mobilities and their traces are archived um, in some of New York's institutions. I said almost because I need to tackle one more question, which is the question of memory. Um, and for that, I want to show you this, which I did take. It's a picture I took in one of the New York museums for an exhibition which is called We Are Who We Archive. And it's funny because I keep remembering this as we are what we archive, but actually it's we are who we archive, which I think is, is particularly significant. <clears throat> now, I read memory practices too as forms of translation. So let me make just a couple of brief, brief remarks on memory studies and translation studies. Here, work on national memory has been increasingly integrated and to an extent superseded by work focusing on the multidirectional um, uh, nature of, of memory, but also its multidimensional um, nature. It's intergenerational dynamics, for instance, which Maria was mentioning the other night, or the intricate networkings created by processes of transnational memory, which is the title also of a recent book, or by what um, Astrid Earle called traveling memory. Translation can be seen as a form of memory. Walter Benjamin's famous essay on the task of the translator with its notion of translation as the afterlife of the text, but also with its image of translation as the recomposition of a broken vessel, offers not only a powerful set of metaphorical representations of translation, but also of memory, that reconstruction that memory does. It foregrounds the work of translation, its reconstructive power, as well as its inevitable transmutations. But it also prefigures the way in which memory, textual memory, historical memory, works with fragmentation, trauma, the remembering of a dismembered experience of the past and its remediation into individual and collective presence as they push us towards the future. Or memory, translation, and the angel of history, if you want, also share the mixed blessing of this complex temporality. Uh, as you know, Benjamin talks about the angel of history being pushed, blown into the future, looking backwards. Memory can also be seen as a form of translation, which, like translation, exceeds the boundary of the nation and of the national, or for that matter, of any forms of community that we might care to focus on. The construction of memory happens as a negotiation between the insides and the outsides across geographic and temporal fracture lines, but also rhizomatic connections. Memory travels across space and time. There is no memory in a vacuum, no memory without a dialogue or a polylogue between experiences of the past and dreams, however bleak or blessed of the future. So memory is transnational as well as translational. And in this sense, and with Benjamin's angel of history in mind, but also that beautiful, powerful image um, from Glissant that Rita mentioned the other day, a you know, prophetic vision of the past. It is fair, I think, with those images in mind, to ask how memory and memorialization shape both our past and our future through processes of translation. So finally, I can get to my central question. How is the memory of Italian mobilities inscribed in one of the iconic cities of the Italian diaspora, that is, New York? This is where I feel like an imposter, because of course there are people in this room and, and, and in other rooms, and you know, Joe Shore is working on this in particular, he's chairing another session. They know much more than me on these topics, but I think, I hope, I can count on my external, dislocated, eccentric position, at times also naive, as I will show you in a second, um, as an advantage, as an Italian-born, British-based, and sort of British-trained to an extent, I looking at the Italian-American experience and its memory. 
Now, as always, I was very ambitious, and I, when I started looking at this, I thought I'll be looking at all the Italian-American museums across the US and various communities. And then I restricted it to New York, and even there, I can't do all of them. So I'll be talking about three or three and a bit um, sort of um, um, elements today. And what I'm hoping to begin to delineate here are different models for archiving, for memorizing, uh, for archiving Italian memory in New York. Modes, narrative modes that, that these take, um, that these representations take, the diverse articulations, the anchoring and or the unmooring, to use a, a, an expression that Alison Phipps has, has used before, of Italian identity, culture, language, um, um, to specific points of reference, to or from. Uh, anchoring and unmooring, and how these articulations represent the history and experience of Italian mobility, or I should say here, is it Italian mobility, is it Italian migration, is it Italian American migration, or presence or history. So I'm querying my own title, but as you will see, what we mean by Italian in New York is in itself under a question mark, of course. Um, there is, and I could have written a completely different paper if instead of, of, of focusing on what I wanted to focus on, I had taken Italian to mean something else, like high renaissance, high culture, canonic culture, and I've gone through um, anything from MoMA to um, you know, the, the, all the big museums in New York. For instance. So let me start from memory as absent presence and also the, my own naivety. But probably the first thing I did when I, I started thinking about this was to go to Brooklyn and to go, in particular, to the Brooklyn Museum. And then from Brooklyn Museum, I went to the Brooklyn Library, expecting to find some traces of Italian presence in the museums at the core, at the heart of Brooklyn. And the interesting thing there is that this, it's really an absent presence. There is very little there. And um, so, when you start looking into the collections, and if you go, you can do this online, by the way. I did it there, but you can do it online. If you go, for instance, to the Brooklyn uh, Museum, and you put into their search the term Italian, you start looking at what comes up. And what comes up is, in the vast majority, is that high culture that I was talking about, you know, exhibitions or exhibits from the Italian Renaissance, from Italian fine arts, and so on. And then occasionally, certain particular things, like a 1975, um, exhibition, temporary exhibition, on Brooklyn's Italian-American community, a photographic essay. But there is no trace in, in the catalogue then of what that exhibition did in particular. If you search for Italian-American, there is no such category. So you end up with you know, 20,000 things which are labelled American, because there isn't such a label. Hyphenated or not hyphenated, Pace, Anthony Tamburi, and, and the, the, the discussion about whether, uh, whether the hyphen should be there. If you look into the library, the library has some really interesting photographic collections, for instance, which are mostly donations by families, families like the Piccione family or the Toscano family, or some, and that's one of them that I, I put there, one of the ones I, I love the most, from the, uh, um, the Greg Chapel, which was one of the places of transit of the Italian community in the early 20th century in particular there. And I love this one. This one is, as you see, a photo by Zinzer um, from 1922-23. And on the back, it says, Italians learning English at Greg Chapel. So again, that assimilation, that language assimilation, I thought this was a good one to think about. But as I said, mostly what you find is the presence of an absence. Then. There's another type of narrative. There's a narrative which is, if you want, a classic narrative, the narrative of struggles and achievements. And that's the narrative that you encounter at the Italian American Museum on Mulberry Street, um, the, uh, the, the, the location traditionally, though no longer of course, but the location that is associated with Little Italy in New York, now surrounded of course by Chinatown and now mostly a tourist destination. An interesting thing, this is a very contentious museum and interesting in, in many ways, but one of the first things that you do, and it, it's interesting, I think there that, that actually we were talking about Kinaglia earlier, weren't we? Mm -hmm. Giorgio Kinaglia, Welsh, Italian, but you know, when I, when I went there, that was one of the things that were in the, in the, in the window. Um, one of the intriguing things is the first thing, as I walked into the museum, the first thing that happened was that I was pushed very quickly towards the back, and I was asked to sit in front of this video, and the video was um, a um, Servizio del Telegiornale, or something like that, from Rai, which 
said, oh, look, this has been opened in, in New York. It was opened in 2001, this, this, this museum, after the Columbus um, sort of celebrations and, 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 and after an exhibition on that. So it, it was really interesting for me because the legitimization of this museum was completely referring back to Italy. We exist, and look, Rai says that we are the place to go to. So it's, it's the sense of we're legitimized by the place of origin and that recognition was the strongest. And then what you find if you look at it, so I'm thinking of Italy as an anchor here, okay? I was talking about anchoring or unmooring. And if, of course, if you take Italy upside down, uh, it looks a bit like an anchor in, in that sense. But it's this anchor to an Italian and and then so that that's the anchor there and then the aims here what is really in focus for me I should have probably um, put in, put them in bold there is no bold of course on the website this is taken from the website from the uh, mission of the place it talks about the museum being dedicated to the struggles of Italian Americans and their achievements and contributions to American culture and society it talks about being more than an immigration museum and it talks about telling the whole story of Italian migration. There are very contradictory messages in here in terms of you know, the whole story, the Italian-American story, the story of struggle and success, which is a, a classic narrative of, of migration, and again, a classic narrative of uh, legitimation. And again, Kia, no trace of other communities, no trace of a process of hybridization, of collaboration, of, of coexistence. Uh, a very hodgepodge collection which goes from Petrosino and La Guardia um, to um, remittance letters and so on. And a very interesting mailing list on which I got and which I've been following, I can't talk about it, but I've been following ever since. And, and I'm thinking, is it meant to be local, regional, national, global? Who's the audience for this place? Okay. Now, a very interesting one. I adore this one. I love it. If you haven't been in the Tenement Museum, incredibly interesting place where it's all about layers and superimposition. I've taken that page because that's what I did. I went to two tours, the Irish tour and then the, the tour about um, in exclusion, uh, sorry, the, the, the hard times, which takes you through some of the same rooms and some are different rooms. But the tale that you are told is a tale located at different m moments in time when that place was occupied by an Irish family, when that place was occupied by an Italian family. You can do the Jewish tour, you can do different kinds of tours. So this is all about layering and different incarnation and superimposition. And what it makes me think of now, um, sort of uh, having read her wonderful book, is Teresa Fiore's book on um, preoccupied spaces. The idea of how we occupy spaces, how we are preoccupied by spaces, but also she says how the preoccupation about no hyphen, about migrants, can be dissipated by looking at past history of migrations and their effects, what I term as pre-hyphen occupation. So here the interesting thing is that these experiences are meant to be presented as equal, as equally powerful and equally important, and yet some are more equal than others. I've been talking about this with Joe, Shora, with Joseph, and, and for instance, if you go to the bookshop, the Italian-American experience is very little represented there. Some are much, much more visible. And there are also some specific absences. There's an absence of expertise. I, I can't tell you the whole thing, but I had a whole discussion about the word ghetto. The person who was thinking around had no idea of where the word ghetto came from, so I ended up explaining to the whole group about that and so on. But it's interesting. And that's some of their, their statements again. Then the epic tale, of course. The epic tale is the tale of Ellis Island. I'm almost finished. Two minutes, um, yeah, yes, yes. Yeah. So it, it's, it's a, it's, it is the epic tale, uh, Ellis Island, the epic of the nation. It's already evident to an extent in the Tenement Museum, but here it's in full flow, okay? It's in, in, in its full glory. Um, the Italian experience is woven into that dramatic, colossal story. So there is no separation here. You see the graphs and you see the, ex the exhibits and they weave together the different, indeed, waves, the different flows, the different groups, um, memorializing them as essentially a tale of um, America and the making of a migrant nation. The focus is on flows, on points of departure, and points of arrival, but they're told as a unidirectional history from to America. That's what we're talking about here. 
And so it's also a unidirectional translation, if you want. It's from all of these things to English as well. And there's a lot of language in that exhibition, by the way, and on assimilation. The focus is firmly on America as a point of arrival, though not always as, as a hospitable point of arrival. And there are, of course, huge blind spots. There is a history of slavery, which has been built into Ellis Island, but there's nothing about Native Americans, and there's nothing about white America being a nation of migrants, of course. That is, is under parenthesis there. And the last thing I want to talk about, because it's about preoccupation, and if someone wants to see the, the book, I brought it all the way from England, from, uh, well, I left from England, but from Wales originally. Um, uh, that is, I couldn't see the exhibition. It was in 2000, 2001, but I have this wonderful book, which is about a remediation and a, a reoccupation or a preoccupation of, or reoccupation of preoccupied spaces. It's an exhibition by a, a fantastic Italian American artist, B. Amore, but at that Amore, third generation, a family comes from uh, Naples. And she created this incredible exhibition inside Ellis Island. So she took six of the rooms, which were dormitories for the, the arriving migrants, and she put the history of, it's concentric circles kind of history. And, and if I show her some, some of the work, you will see also how the, the, there's a lot of writing. It, it, there's a theme here, of course, about, about writing and weaving, and it goes to, to Angela Cavalieri's work, to, to Lucy Calipari Marcuzzo's work as well. But there's a theme of weaving embroidery um, words. And, and what she does is tell a history of her own family. And then enlarging that circle, it becomes a history of Italian-American families. And enlarging that circle, it becomes a history of broader communities and waves of migration. And, and enlarging that, it becomes even further a sort of global history of mobility. Um, one of the things, the only thing I will say about our exhibition was that one of the things that I was proudest of is the fact that through that exhibition, which we organized first in Rome and then in London, then in New York and then here, we brought together, actually, in, in spirit and in, and in body in some ways, um, the work of Bia Moore with the work of Lucy Calipari Marcuzzo, who you didn't know each other before. I'm looking at Lucy down there before. But we looked at this. I looked at this and that this is fantastic. You're using the same metaphors. You're using some of the same materials. And you're talking about gendered experiences. You're talking about labor and the labor of the invisible labor, in particular, of migrant women. You're talking about so many of the same things. So, to conclude in one sentence, mooring and unmooring Italianness is only a center, an anchor, or as a series of, series of dynamic dislocations and translations of a place which becomes a symbolic order, if you want, but not necessarily the order that has to, um, to, to decide who we are and exactly how we frame Italianness. Speciality, directionality, is, is all of this a one directional trip or actually is it, is it not a series of concentric circles and much more complex networks? Temporality and memory and looking backwards but looking at our future. I want to finish by reminding you there's a very famous sentence by Kierkegaard who talks about the most paf painful state of being uh, is remembering the future, particularly the one you'll never have. <laughs> but when I read that, I always also think of Gramsci. And Gramsci says, we cannot reach what we cannot imagine. And there is no way. The biggest failures are the failures of our imagination. We cannot imagine our future without a prophetic vision of our past. Yeah.